I'm Joan Brzezinski, and I'm director of the China Center. We are excited to welcome you here today to hear Professor Duncan McCampbell of Metropolitan State University for his present presentation, War or Collapse, Why Today's China Discussion Needs a Reboot. But first, allow me to thank you for your support and uh, your support and of this webinar series and of the China Center. Your generosity makes it programs like this possible. I offer a special thanks to Kai Mei and Joseph Terry for their generous support of this program. We invite you to help us advance our mission and give to the China Center through the link on the webinar announcement or on our website. At the end of the program, Professor McCampbell will answer your questions and submit, um, that you submit through the key uh, button at the bottom of the screen. Professor Campbell is a frequent speaker and lecturer on international business and foreign affairs. Currently, he is the a tenured associate professor at the College of Management at Metropolitan State University here in Minnesota, where he teaches courses in international business and marketing while also serving as the department chair. Over the last decade, he has taught regularly in China as a visiting scholar at the University of International Business and Economics, Hunan Institute of Science and Technology, Kwai Hua University, and South China University of Technology. From national security to Taiwan, to economic competitiveness uh, and technology, today's headlines are alarming. Experts tend to take extreme positions, policies are combative, and the nuances of this complicated relationship are ignored. So we welcome Professor Duncan today, joining us from Bangkok to give his view on how to solve these issues. Welcome, Duncan. Thank you, Joan. It's, it's a delight to be here. And I will definitely uh, echo um, the executive director's words about the importance of the China Center's mission, um, particularly at this at this time in American history. It's not easy um, these days to uh, watch what is going on. Um, and as we kind of sort of sleepwalk our way into conflict, and I think that broader understanding of the issues is always welcomed. And I want to thank uh, Kai Mei and Joseph Terry for their support. And I'm sure Kai Mei is tuning in and we'll have lots of very pointed questions for me afterwards, as she always does. So with that beginning, um, when I started doing writing my book, I did my literature review and all of those things. And I noticed that it was pretty simple to lump people into one or two, one of two uh, analytic camps about China. And we'll talk about those. Um, and how they only tell part of the story and they don't always get us moving in productive directions. So, um, Hyann, if you'll please re uh, advance the slides. Thank you. Uh, Thompson Reuters posted me to Beijing in January of 2007 to start a new business. That was my first major encounter with China. And since that time, I have returned to teach almost every year at uh, major Chinese universities and to do consulting for American businesses. My last um, assignment in China was in um, Haiyan. in Hunan, which uh, was at the Institute of, uh, the, uh, Hunan Institute of Technology in, um, in Yuyang, in uh, central China. And um, I was there to teach uh, law and business courses. Um, and I had to leave rather abruptly um, as the pandemic was blooming, um, just about a hundred miles north of Yuyang in Wuhan. And I'm pleased to say that I'm on my way back to China and um, we'll be visiting my friends and colleagues um, in a couple of days. So where I would like to go with this, um, with an overview is to begin with an introduction that um, 
places this conversation in the right context. I'm not here to um, advocate for any particular point of view. I'm certainly not here to to um, gloss over any of the aspects of the Chinese system, which is inconsistent with ours. What I'm here to do is to um, share with you some thoughts about how the current discussion, like so many other things in American uh, uh, in American public affairs, is uh, tends to be polarized, and to uh, drive to the extremes, and to suggest a way forward that is going to be useful to the American people and hopefully the world. So what? Uh, how we tend to process our Chinese position is culturally bound because we are descended from the ancient Greeks. We also tended to believe that uh, Americans uh, or that powers as they become more um, assertive are going to go around the world and do things like 17th century Europeans, which is to get in ships and send soldiers and conquer and colonize. And then we also believe that Americans, as good Americans, in the continuation of trends, even ones that we don't particularly like. The realists um, tend to break down into um, a very well-defined group. And there's also the people who say that China um, is reeling under a number of concerning situations and will soon collapse, if not economically or politically. We need to reboot this conversation before we sleepwalk into conflict. There are 15 factors that got China to where it is today. And what a lot of people aren't willing to acknowledge is that most of the things that got China to where it is today are either in the process of going away or are completely gone. So we are talking about a changing environment for China's future and its trajectory. I will talk a little bit about the iron rules of Chinese history. This is detailed in far more um, extensive analysis in my book. But um, one of the things that we as Americans tend to um, believe is that we can drive change and developments in the world. And this might be true in some cases. In, in the case of China, China will um, go where it goes according to at, at the way that it always has for thousands of years. And understanding how China works internally is very important to understanding what their trajectory is in the future. And finally, I'm going to close with a few things that say what we should be doing um, while China gets its legs under it again and continues to grow. Okay. What many Americans don't understand or fully grasp is how rapidly China got to where it is today. And the reason that's important is because China, unlike any other major economy in world history, didn't have the luxury of time to produce all of the stability creating institutions and processes that other countries have had. And one thing I wanted to particularly bring to your attention in this slide is where the hockey stick of China's um, GDP growth, growth occurred, which was right at the beginning when China was became uh, a member of the World Trade Organization with American support of the Clinton administration, which gave China access, tariff-free access to world markets for the, the goods that the Chinese people made. That is, that is the most um, consequential uh, event in China's modern economic development. When we look at China, we tend to encounter China the way we are culturally prepared. This book, Nisbet's 
cultures uh, or the, the um, geography of thought is a book that I use to teach Americans about understanding Chinese culture. And fortunately, the book is also available in a high quality translation in China. And I use that book to teach my Chinese law students about how Americans think and therefore how the American legal system was created and what its priorities are. But one of the most important distinctions between Chinese culture and American culture is the American belief in individual freedom and agency, which is descended from the ancient Greeks. This contrasts with the Chinese predisposition to achieve harmony. We are individualists in America, the Chinese are collectivists, and this is often the, our point of departure when we are looking at a culture like China's. How we process our China, our China problem, like ancient Greeks. The Greeks loved debate. They loved to resolve contradictions through rhetorical means, through contests. That's what they do. And that's what we do as Americans. We want to know who is going to win. The Chinese don't work that way. Uh, the Chinese um, are far more inclined to seek al alternative um, methods to resolve conflicts. We also believe that any country that has a huge blue water navy like the Chinese do will do what 17th century Europeans always did. They loaded up soldiers on ships and sent them to foreign places, subjugated, colonized, extracted. And we have to remember that China was on the receiving end of much of that behavior in the 17th and 18th centuries. However, um, this runs up against a rather awkward fact is that the Chinese had, have always had the capability to co colonize. And this goes back to the treasure voyages of Admiral He, and they haven't done that. And like Americans, we believe in the continuation of trends. If you'll look at the chart at the bottom right, that is China's GDP growth. And people look at that and go, holy moly, our goose is cooked. But as we will discuss, as we will discuss, that is not a trend that is going to continue. We will revert to the mean. And, and actually the Chinese look at that trend and have an opposite reaction because they believe in balance. So anything that is out of kilter, anything that has gone too far will always spring backwards towards the middle. Okay. Now, the popular literature out there is dominated by these uh, uh, war and collapse analyses, and it sells books, and both of them actually play on our insecurities. The, the, war, the war genre, dominated by two best-selling authors, uh, Graham Allison and Michael Pillsbury, and they say that the Chinese have the secret plan, um, long-term plan to take over the world. And we better, you know, do something about that. Uh, the collapse genre use um, mostly inapplicable Western economic um, methods to look at China's system and say, you know, they're not going to, they're gonna collapse. Uh, they, they can't carry on doing what they're doing. Um, finally, I, I, I add a few other authorities to the bottom because these ones tend to be not as dire and as catastrophic as the other two. I particularly call into call to your attention uh, Invisible China. Uh, this is a uh, Stanford demographer that has worked in rural China in education for um, decades. And he says something that's very interesting. He says that because 
um, urban elites in China are not having children because they can't afford them mostly. The future of China is in is in the hands of the places where ch children are being born in China, which is in the country. But because of the existence of basically two Chinas, those countries, uh, the, the countryside and the people in it are under are undereducated, uh, comparable to the urban classes, um, often malnourished. Um, but that's that's China's future. Actually, it's it's a it's a devastating analysis. Okay. The the problem with uh, Graham, if you please progress to the next major slide. Thank you, Graham Allison. Uh, draws a parallel to the. Greeks um, that were fighting during the Pel Peloponnesian War, um, Athens and Sparta. Sparta was the U.S. analog, the established status quo partner uh, power in that part of the Mediterranean. Athens was the upstart, the challenger. China wants to take on the top dog. Now, Allison cites of rising power contests, not just in ancient Greece, but throughout Western, mostly Western history. And the central theme is that anytime a, an established power is being challenged by an upstart, that war usually follows. Okay. There is one problem, major problem with Allison's analysis. And that is that Athens and China have very little in common. When Athens decided to get uppity and to take on the established power Sparta, the Athenians were already deeply experienced in war. The, in fact, uh, if you'll progress to the next slide, please. Before taking on Sparta, Athenian forces had already defeated the dominant power in the Eastern Mediterranean, which was Persia at the time. And those Greek coalitions that fought off the Persians were led primarily by Athenian military leaders. Next. Contrast that with today's China. China has the world's largest Navy, the world's largest land army, it always has, but it has no military experience, zero. The last time China fought a war of any consequence was in 1979 against Vietnam. And China did not come out looking very good in that contest. But there is no one in China's vast military that has any experience commanding a combat formation in war, not a single individual. Please progress the slide. The gentleman on the right was a torchbearer at the Beijing Olympics. Why? Because he commanded the group of Chinese uh, soldiers who fought the Indians on the top of the world in the Himalayas with rocks and stones. It's a little known that the Chinese and the Indians, because they regularly get into skirmishes um, up there on the top of the world in the Himalayas, have decided that they will not arm their soldiers with guns and knives and other things that kill people. So when these soldiers met, they beat each other with clubs. And that created a national hero, this gentleman who commanded those Chinese forces was made a torchbearer at the Beijing Olympics. He is the closest thing that China has to a MacArthur, to a Guderian, to a Freiburg. Okay. Next, I want to 
target, Michael Pillsbury. Um, one of the things that got me interested in writing this book was I actually saw Michael Pillsbury speak at Chautauqua a couple summers ago. Um, and uh, he's very experienced, um, but I just, I just did not agree with many of the conclusions that he made in that speech and in his book. It's a very popular book, The 100 Year Marathon. He based his his argument on 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 our American belief in trends that this 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 behemoth of China's military is going to continue to grow, and 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 particularly its economy is going to continue to grow, and it will form a threat to the rest of the world. And he characterizes China as a distance runner, that they have a long-term plan to get to this place of global domination, to be a superpower. Okay. What he gets so wrong is that China is not a distance runner. It is the strongest, fastest, rule agnostic steroid juiced sprinter in world history when i say steroid juiced i say the muscles of this sprinter have been artificially enhanced through any number of measures the one-way street commercial streets um, that characterize china's interaction with the world the support of state-owned enterprises the military civilian fusion these are all methods that China has used to vault itself into, into prominence economically. But its business model is unsustainable. One more click, please, Haiyan. Chinese premier, this is the number two person in the Chinese leadership that is responsible for economic affairs, said that China's growth model is unsustainable. And if you look at the statistics and where China is going, they have run out of the engine for their growth, which is a debt and investment model. So what they have to do now in the same time period that approximated their incredible rise to economic prominence about 40 years, is convert those fast twitch muscle fibers of a sprinter into the efficient slow twitch muscle fibers of a distance runner, of a sustainable economy. It's going to be a very difficult process. Okay. The collapse genre says looks at all these things debt is is the big one and says you know there's just no way that uh this is going to continue the the leading light of the collapse genre is a chap it's a chap named gordon chang that wrote a book about 20 years ago that says you know the people have had it they're ready to throw the government out well there's just absolutely no evidence for that and the reason that I say that is uh, when you, we look at COVID zero, um, it challenged the Chinese people in ways that we can't even imagine as Americans. And the only thing it produces, what that, which actually led to some change, was what they called the A7 or the um, sorry the, the 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 A10 protest, where people held up blank pieces of paper, um, but it didn't it didn't lead to pitchforks pitchforks in the streets. Um, the reason most of the collapse genre fails to enlighten us is because they tended to use Western metrics for measuring the prospects of the Chinese economy. And there is actually very little about the Chinese economy that has any direct analog to what we have here in the United States or indeed much of the Western world. Okay.
if you look at some of the data about the Chinese uh, economy and um, the unbalanced nature of it, and you look at some of the events that have happened in the last few years, for example, the property crisis that is that is roiling one third one, one third of China's GDP is produced by the uh, the private housing market, and it is tanking. That needs to. That would have collapsed a Western economy like ours. It would have led to bank failures. Um, we just had another bank that was put into receivership the other day. The, the, the difference is, is that so many of these, these metrics that we use, whether it's property or it's um, uh, the industrial output, these are all distorted by the, by the involvement of the state in China's economy and the moral hazard which follows from that because you know we have this belief in the west that if a business is weak if it is poorly managed that it needs to be allowed to fail well the chinese don't want that to happen because it could lead to contagion and so a bank might become overburdened with debt or off or off the book um, in uh, liabilities or non-performing loans, but the Chinese government will always step in and hover for the bad business decisions of that bank. It's called moral hazard, and it's the idea that at the end of the day, the state will always intervene to bail out bad actors in the business community. Okay. Now let's talk about the 15 factors that got China to this point. M most important thing that unleashed the immense power of Chinese people was government got out of the way of the uh, of business and the private sector. Government also created two Chinas. The coasts were there to interact with the outside world and to act as manufacturing centers. The interior of China was to supply low-paid, hard-working labor to the coasts. And the hukou system has perpetuated that, that, that structure. The, one of the greatest benefits of the high household saving rates of the Chinese people is that it gave the government access to a lot of cheap cash that they could reinvest in GDP producing um, investments. China has always had access to foreign technology and industrial know-how. It has always had access to Western capital and debt, and debt markets. So a Chinese company can list its shares on the New York Stock Exchange. A U.S. company cannot do the same thing on a mainland exchange. Access to foreign natural resources. China is actually very resource poor in a lot of areas, particularly in oil and gas and in food. Access to export, export markets. So WTO accession, as I said earlier, created that hockey stick in growth. Massive foreign direct investments. One way monetary, financial, and financial and legal re regulatory streets. China is full of unfairness and lack of reciprocity when it comes to commercial matters. China has always had an, a, a pragmatic, adaptive government. It needed to be pragma pragmatic and adaptive because, as Deng Xiaoping said, we are crossing the river feeling the stones. China didn't have a roadmap for this massive change that China would undergo since Mao died. And so it had to try things out and reject things if they didn't work and try something new. China, for better or worse, has had generally positive or neutral, neutral foreign relations with much of its business partners. It has remained strategically unthreatening, except to its neighbors, to 
the established powers in the world. Um, allowing for low military spending relative to GDP, which is focus on domestic priorities, and of course, hard work by millions of Chinese people. Okay. My book is about why those 15 factors are going away, largely and how China is not going to collapse. It's not going to go to war with the United States. It's going to through a, a, it's often, it will often be a very painful process of reconfiguring its economic and growth model to be more sustainable. Because if you go to the 15 factors, government is back in the face. If you'll advance the slide, please, Hayan. Government is back in the face of the private sector. The deliberate creation of two Chinas has created a permanent underclass of migratory workers. Bottomless supply of low paid labor is going away. The one child only policy um, dealt that a critical blow and the government, even though it is allowing people to have more children, they're not having them because they can't afford them. The debt and debt and uh, investment driven export model has run its course. Inbound foreign technology is not coming in the way it used to. Um, and the US is leading particularly a tech embargo on China. Inbound foreign domestic, domestic um, investment is slowing. Um, access to Western um, capital markets, the Chinese government is discouraging Chinese companies from listing their shares on foreign exchanges. Uh, very crucially, China has fraught relations with most of its trading partners. Um, pragmatic and adaptive government, zero COVID put the lie to that because that policy stuck around far longer than it ever should have. And that was because it was tied to the supreme leader. Um, I wanted to also mention um, that as China is building up its military, that means that it is diverting resources that it used to dedicate to um, mostly internal and domestic development priorities. Okay, next slide. I encourage everyone to read uh, Pettis. Uh, this guy is on the faculty, the economics faculty of Peking University, one of the top universities in China, and he gets it on China's economy. The main point is that the growth model, the debt and investment growth model that drove China to the point that it is today is completely unsustainable and that additional investments in building things are creating less and less returns as a proportion of the investment. So the low hanging fruit has been plucked. Okay, next slide. This is a, a, a desperately important point is the China has gotten to where it is today by interacting with the world. China toggles through periods of closing down in self-protective mode and opening to the world. China got to where it is today by interacting with the world, trading with the world, accepting investments and technology. And now what has happened because it has become more assertive and more aggressive is relations with the world are at the lowest point, even, even after Tiananmen Square. You go to the next slide. If you look at any of the major trading partners that China has, the US of course, being of the two, the US and EU, major developing developed economies 
the people in those places have increasingly negative views of China. It is unnecessary and it is unproductive and it is not in China's interest. But what, what, ha what, what has been the outcome of this assertiveness that China is showing both regionally and globally? If you go to the next slide, please. All sorts of alliances are building the Quad, Japan, India, the United States, and, and Australia. It's not, a, it's not a military alliance, but it is a, in a cooperation structure. The Australian, US, and UK nuclear submarine partnership is a direct response to the uh, Chinese threat. You might recall that there was a time when the U.S. was not particularly welcomed by the government of the Philippines. That has changed under a new leader, and the U.S. has been asked to send visiting forces into um, several bases across the Philippines, which is a dramatic turnaround and is directly the result of the aggressive Chinese behavior in the South China Sea towards Philippine fishermen and Philippine uh, territorial claims. And most remarkably, as you might know, Japan and South Korea have had a difficult relationship going back to World War II and the things that went on in Korea uh, when it was occupied by the Imperial Japanese forces. And the behavior of China and the behavior of the North Korean regime has forced these two very important American allies into a rapprochement, if you will. And their leaders are getting together and figuring out ways to cooperate. This is the result. All of these are the result of China's assertive conduct in the region. Go to the next slide, please. Where this leaves us today, I think I'll scream if I see another person saying that the U.S. is in decline. It is not in decline. This is what the Chinese would like to think, and that it will therefore lead for opportunities for China to replace the United States and move into the space that the U.S. used, used to occupy. The U.S. now heads a coalition that is pushing back against the authoritarian regimes in China and in Russia. No matter what someone might say, this is not a bid to stay number one, whatever that means. It is not a bid to contain China. We must recall that the United States actually was responsible for the WTO accession. It pushed and advocated for China to join the WTO and become the economic powerhouse that it is today. What the world wants is a peaceful China. We have to protect and strengthen our institutions and our alliances. Now, we know that China wants to reshape that system and it wants to remove threats, Hong Kong and Taiwan in particular. And China will go through a period of rapid and painful change. It is inevitable, it's going to happen. This leaves China in no position to take over the world, but it also means that China will not collapse because China is a survival machine, the government of China. And during that time of change and adaptation and development and maturation, China will not grow as much as it once did. And we have to be prepared for that. If you go to the next slide, please. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. The iron rules of Chinese history and culture, these are detailed in far more extent uh, in my book. I wanted to just bring your attention to a few of these. Um, iron rule number three, assuring regime and dynasty survival is the first priority of every Chinese leader. 
everything that the party does today is about keeping the party in power. And we must always remember that. And there is growing scholarship that says that as regimes, the Chinese uh, imperial regimes tried to survive and extend their rule, they ran up against two potentially destabilizing influences, external forces and internal elites. And so what the Chinese leaders always did was try to manage or eliminate the threats of internal elites. But what that usually ended up doing was enfeebling the states because often the most able people in the system um, were also the most threatening. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was a very capable administrator, a very pragmatic administrator, was twice purged by Mao because he was too good. But he was always brought back to Beijing to clean up Mao's messes. And iron rule number seven is really important for folks to remember that China always toggles between engagement and withdrawal. Because engagement with the world introduces viruses, if you will, into a system that lacks the antibodies to combat them. And in the cases of in the case of the of the treasure voyages of Admiral He, it created a merchant class. The riches that were brought through um, the, the trade routes that were opened and riches that came into pouring into China created a merchant class, which was a threat to the emperor. In just the same way as Ant Group and Alibaba and Tencent and all of these other huge Chinese corporations had to be brought down several notches because they become less beholden to the authority. If you go to the next slide, please. Xi Jinping has surrounded himself with loyalists. This is what every Chinese emperor does that survives any length of time. That extends the rule of the regime, but it also weakens the regime because other voices are not in the conversation. China had a collectivist leadership model that existed after Mao because Mao became too powerful and there were no checks on his power. So they said, well, we're going to have the top layer of Chinese government, the Politburo Standing Committee, be comprised of a person who is the first among equals, but also representing different factions. Well, she has gotten rid of all the factions and the voices that come from them. So now there are only people that are loyal to um, Xi Jinping. And no one in that Politburo Standing Committee has any significant international experience. This is the first time since Mao that that has existed. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is remember when China needed to connect or reconnect with the world, particularly after Tiananmen Square and Jiang Zemin got on planes and went all over the world. Uh, there are lots of photos of Deng Xiaoping wearing cowboy hats in Texas and these were people, horses for courses, that were there to help China interact with the world, to be less threatening to the world. Well, Xi Jinping is not that type of person. He is focused domestically, and he has surrounded himself with party people who are going to help him solve some of China's big domestic problems. But if international relations were his priority, he would have people that had expertise in those areas. And that does not exist at the upper echelons of China's government. The next slide, if you will, please. I mentioned the treasure voyages. Um, 
And the fact that it created a merchant class that threatened the uh, established powers, um, this has happened throughout Chinese history. When China engages with the world, it brings riches, but it also brings destabilizing forces. And we are now in the process of watching China withdraw back in on itself. There was a, a brilliant article in Bloomberg yesterday uh, by a Chinese writer in Hong Kong that said that if you want to invest in China, that's great as long as you're Chinese. This is because these Hong Kong people that were always very sort of central, this osmotic layer between China and the West, were always able to get data on Chinese companies and shareholders and you know, equity positions. And the Chinese government is shutting down access to that information for internal security reasons. So China is drawing back in on itself, is trying to be more self-sufficient. This is that dual circulation model, trying to create a domestic market to drive its economy. So we are now in the process of watching China draw back in on itself. And we must always remember that China got to where it is today by engagement with the world. So there's no way that China can draw back in on itself and not suffer economic consequences of that decision. Okay, the next slide, please. This is something that is very little discussed, but Xi Jinping has stayed in, uh, has extended his rule. There's nothing in the Chinese constitution or there wasn't that says that someone has to, has to retire after filling out two five-year terms. But the entire Chinese um, Communist Party's discipline and patronage system is based upon those 10-year leadership turnover cycles, and he's not moving. And there are thousands of people, hardworking, ambitious, able party functionaries whose careers have been stunted by the fact that there is not a turnover at the top, because when a new leader comes in, they bring in their own people. And all sorts of vacancies and opportunities arrive. And that is not happening. And finally, another point that needs to be mentioned, if you'll please advance the slide, Haiyan, is that what she has done is built a structure where all important decisions go to the top. You might have heard about a um, a fire that occurred in a hospital in Beijing about a week and a half ago. It, there was a fire because there was some construction that went on. Well, some people died and it was um, a, a big deal because it's a famous hospital in central Beijing, but it was not covered by the Chinese media for 12 hours. Now, if it happened in Minneapolis, there would be a van with a with a satellite uplink and with regular updates. But in China, people are afraid to speak, report, decide. And there is a, and this also happened when the uh, spy balloons went over the United States is our defense secretary got on the phone to call his opposite number in China and the phone just rang. Well, it wasn't that that there wasn't someone at the other end and it wasn't that there wasn't someone that wanted to talk to them, but you don't talk until you get your directions. And in the Leninist system, all roads lead to the top. And I'm of the firm belief that the system that Xi Jinping has set up that's put him in charge of just about everything that matters in China is going to he, he cannot he cannot make all those important decisions for a highly complex, rapidly changing place like China um, he has to delegate, and that's something that isn't happening now. So it's a limitation to China's growth. Okay, so if we'll just close up here with the final final slide. We have to remember that this is a China that is that is about to undergo some major changes. And I believe 
that one of the reasons Xi Jinping was brought in because he's a strong man is because the party knows that the cans that have been kicked down the road through the last two leadership cycles can't be kicked down the road anymore. And someone needs to come in and make some pretty important and disruptive decisions in order to keep China going on a positive trajectory. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Um, I believe that uh, it's, it's unnecessary for China to be as threatening as it is to the rest of the world, especially militarily. Um, but where we, what we should be doing right now as China um, undergoes these necessary changes um, is dispossess ourselves of the notion that we can force China to change. They'll do what they need to do in their own time. Um, we cannot economically decouple from China. It's just not possible. This isn't like the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed, it didn't even register on Western stock indexes because there was no connection between the Soviet economy and outside. It is the absolute opposite case now. China is economically integrated with the world. We cannot allow the China, China to pluck the fruits of innovation that, that are produced by our leading institutions and universities and not pay for them. We cannot react defensively and emotionally about various threats. The spy balloon situation was, was frustrating for me because it really wasn't much of a threat, but we're not used to having foreign powers flying stuff over our airspace. Uh, we cannot allow free media to, assisted by our opponents, to divide us in, in the United States. I am encouraged by some of the things that I'm watching about how Fox News is being called to question on some of the things that the very, the very destructive things that Fox News did to our democratic institutions. And I think that is a positive move in the right direction. And we must not go to war with China under any circumstances. We must know that our strength, our strength has always been in our ability to form friendships and alliances. China does not do alliances. It has some odd arrangement with Russia now. It is not an alliance. It is a marriage of convenience. We must make it militarily impossible for China to believe that it can blockade or attack Taiwan, which is the most likely scenario of conflict between the United States and China. We must drive coercion risk out of our supply chains because the Chinese do not look at free markets as something which are governed by rules. What the Chinese want to do is to control certain markets for certain um, particularly strategic commodities like rare earths and lithium and other things. They don't just want to participate. They want to own and control those markets and use them as coercive instruments. We must protect our open systems and institutions, support our friends and allies, write laws that condition access to our free resources on reciprocal access. There was a law that was recently uh, passed out of committee in Texas, um, uh, prohibiting the sale of Texas land to any hostile foreign forces. That's that. First of all, that's unconstitutional. Um, but second of all, what you just need to say is, I'll tell you what, China, we'll let you buy land or, or Chinese investors in the United States. Uh, just as soon as we can buy land in China, which isn't gonna happen because the Chinese can't even own land. And allow the iron rules of Chinese history to function. Step back and understand that China operates according to ancient rhythms. And it is taking China in a direction that it always has taken. It is going to shut down. It is going to close in on itself. It is going to focus on its domestic challenges. That's always what it has done. 
It is not in a position to take over the world. It will not collapse. And we need to turn down the volume and understand that this is a process that needs to run its course. Okay, well, that's all I have to share with you today. And Joan, I think um, we might uh, have some uh, questions that come through. Yes, I think we do. Um, I'm going to hand off to Hai Yen. She'll be handling the question. And thank you so much for today's uh, webinar. That was fascinating. And I think your ideas deserve widespread um, uh, sharing and um, acknowledgement. Thank you so very much. It's an honor. Thank you, Professor. This has been a very informative and inspiring presentation. I've learned a lot. So we have seen a lot of questions pouring in. Um, how real is China's plan to raise the standard of living for the ordinary citizen? Can we rely on the year-to-year -year, uh, Gini coefficient measurements? That's a very good question. Um, I've always said that, um, well, although the if, if, for those of you that um, are, aren't economists, and I'm not one either, a Gini coefficient is a is a measure of the relative inequality in a particular society. Um, the United States has a high Gini coefficient because we are actually not a, a system, an economic system based on equality of outcomes. It's an equality of opportunity. Um, China's Gini coefficient has been rising almost to... Um, to U.S. levels, which is awkward for a country that characterizes itself as communist. But the question raises a, a, a something that has vexed Chinese leaders from the beginning of the the new um, China, and that is how to how to deal with the vast inequality be, between the rich provinces, mostly on the coast. And the interior provinces. There was an article yesterday from um, Guizhou province is one of the poorest provinces in China and its, and its local governments and its banks are collapsing under the weight of, they were always um, struggling but they can't get credit because they're poor. Um, the, the difference between the, the per capita GDP in a province like Guizhou um, and um, you know Beijing or um, in the Shanghai area is is just um, it's 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 immense. So I don't know what the government is doing to close that inequality gap, but it is one that has persisted throughout modern Chinese history, and it's a big big problem. One of the biggest things um, that was brought to, uh, to to light in the book, one of the books that I mentioned, uh, the the myth of, of Chinese capitalism by Dexter Roberts, is the the Hu Kao system, which which creates a permanent underclass of migrant workers. You know, they they leave the countryside, they go to Beijing or to some other um, rich place and and work on construction projects, but they don't have local health care, they don't have local education, they can't bring their families. Um, it's a problem. Thank you. Here's the next question. Um, he said, very insightful and a balanced lecture. Um, we'll be curious on thoughts on the ongoing de-dollarization that is starting and uh, its potential impact on world dynamics. Because it's just it's not just PRC being more assertive with RMB, but also some other countries like India, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, etc. So at this time of uh, unprecedented then to the money printing, escalating series of bank failures, central bank uh, ramping up purchases in gold, et cetera. Uh, so from history, no dominant reserve currency has yet proven to last forever. What do you think of that? Well, if I read another de-dollarization screed from somebody that says the dollar is dying, is dead, I think I will probably lose my mind. Here, here are the facts. Um, the, the top four reserve currencies in the world are in order, the US dollar, the Euro, the Great Brit 
Great Britain pound and the Japanese yen. No, the yen is before the pound. Okay. So those are four reserve currencies that are the world's leading reserve currencies. In other words, a government stashes its reserves in those currencies because it trades in those and it needs to buy things in that are dominated in dollars or in euros. China's the, the use of China's uh, RMB for international transactions sits about one tenth of a percentage point above the Canadian dollar. What is happening with this stuff with Brazil and Saudi Arabia, they're trading commodities and trading between themselves in commodities, whether that's soybeans from Brazil or oil from Saudi Arabia. But the, the dollar is not de-dollarizing. And also this notion of the dollar hegemony, you know, like the dollar is, is, is being, you know, brutally abused. The dollar is just, the dollar is the number one reserve currency in the world because it's freely convertible. It's stable. The government doesn't muck around with it. Now, the reason that a lot of people have gotten talking about this de-dollarization is because the U.S. has finally done something with Russia that has used the dollar's uh, dominance to punish a, a regime which is abusing its access to the dollar and the system that the dollar has created. So this, this idea of the BRIC getting together and starting a new sort of currency it's it's helium helium and the dollar is up there at the top but so is the yen so is the euro so is the great british pound because they're based on market based economies that are well regulated that uh, that are freely convertible which the rmb is not now mark my words RMBs are flowing out of China so fast that they can't stop it. Why? This is a good question, but I'll take the next one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question. While the U.S. and others may bring culture into how we understand China and its intentions, regarding Beijing's Taiwan policy, what mistakes may we be making by not taking Beijing at its word on what it plans to do to get back Taiwan, as well as how Beijing as uh, more than China rather than traditional China views its long-term relations with a capitalist democratic US as a world leader? Wow, that's a big one. Okay, right. <laughs> I may be in the minority, but this is how I view Taiwan. I view Taiwan actually in the same way that I view Ukraine. Both are embarrassments to the dominant system. And let me describe what I'm saying here. Taiwan used to be a one party dictatorship up until the 1990s. They held their first presidential election in the late 1990s, okay? So Taiwan has morphed peacefully from a one party authoritarian state into a vibrant, pluralist democracy. That is awkward for Beijing, which would like people to believe that Chinese culture is inconsistent with democracy. Taiwan is also highly successful economically. I, I don't have the statistics at my fingerprints, but at, at my fingertips, but the GDP per capita in Taiwan is something like 10 times what it is in China. So the Taiwanese have been successful in business and in ec economic matters. Taiwan is the world's leading producer of, of semiconductors. They make the most advanced semiconductors in the world. China has invested something like a trillion dollars in a failed effort to create a domestic semiconductor industry that competes with South Korea and Taiwan. Okay, so what 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 Taiwan is? This isn't this isn't a matter of ownership. This is a matter of the fact that as, as long as Taiwan is out there doing well, being successful, this is an embarrassment to Beijing. In the same way that a, a Ukraine which is moving towards Europe and away from 
the oligarchic klep kleptocratic model, um, model that is that is dominant in Russia is a threat to Russia. So that's why that's why Beijing needs to take Taiwan under its control is to remove that embarrassment, that that dis, this disruption in the same way that they did with Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. There was a second half to that question, Hayan, that I that I've uh, forgotten about. So that was the the question about Taiwan. So the reason Taiwan um, also the reason the world is is actually become more interested in Taiwan is the product of the semiconductor shortage. You know, it wasn't so long ago that you couldn't go to the Ford dealership and buy a car because the the chips that could fit into the palm of your hand were not available. Well, that made everyone realize. Well, man, chips are kind of important. And the idea of Beijing controlling the world's leading chip making center mm -hmm. is kind of scary to, to a lot of people. So the Germans and the Swedes and the, the Europeans and everyone else, said, we can't let Beijing subjugate and own Taiwan because the most strategic um, commodity in the world today is not oil anymore, it's chips, and we can't let them control that. So that's why the rest of the world has gotten kind of more interested in the whole sort of Taiwan situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a second part to this question. It asked um, how Beijing as a modern China rather than traditional China views its long-term relations with a capitalist democratic US as a world leader. Can we be making any mistakes on that? Well, China has always been good at um, engaging with the capitalist system. But, but first, let me let's let's deal with the misnomer. There are some people that can't seem to mention the word China without hissing through clenched teeth the word communist. The Chinese are not communists. Hmm. It is that happens to be the name of their party. They are state capitalists, is what they are. So they engage in capitalist markets, but the state plays an outsized role in that engagement. OK, so they're not they're not collectivists. They don't you know, they don't they don't have a planned economy the way the Soviets did. In fact, we would be so lucky if they were actually communists because we could just kind of wait around for the whole rotten structure to, to collapse. But they're not. So what they do is, is they take the parts of the capitalist system that they like and that work for them and they maximize that like access to Wall Street. And, you know, the largest IPO in history until a few years ago was a Chinese company, Alibaba. So they, 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 they participate in the system, but they abuse the rules. And so this, this is what I talk about when I talk about the concept of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Let's not make laws that punish China. Let's make laws that say, okay, you want to buy farmland in North Dakota? Fine. You can do that just as soon as I can buy farmland on a mountainside in Hunan province. Okay, done. This way the Chinese don't feel as if they're being singled out. We are part of a system. They have benefited enormously from participating in this system, but there are certain rules and reciprocity. And this is the thing that doesn't exist in China today. They want your money. They want you to invest in China, but when you try to take, when I started that business in Beijing, we had a hell of a time getting our revenue out of China mm -hmm. because it's one-way streets. So we have to be much better at, at saying, no, those one-way streets, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna tolerate that anymore. Okay. All right, so the next one, I'm trying to merge some questions together. A few of our audience was asking about China's recent foreign policy, uh, making a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. How serious um, do you think is its peace plan for Ukraine? And then what do you think of this um, recent foreign affairs success of China? Well, if, if China or anyone else brings Iran and Saudi Arabia together and reduces the temperature and stops all those proxy wars in the Middle East, Fabulous. I'm all for it. China has not been a leader in 
resolving international conflicts in the past, if that is a new thing that they are doing, I'm all for it. People say, well, you know, the US isn't a factor in the, in the Middle East anymore. And so the Chinese are moving into that space. Well, we have expended enormous resources, capital resources, leadership resources, trying to get the Middle East to a, a point of stability. But it, it would have been impossible for the United States to broker um, any kind of arrangement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, because Iran, we're still the great Satan over there, and the Saudis have their own sort of way of doing things. I don't think that that, that, that alliance, if whatever it is, with that, that arrangement is going to really produce um, many results. But if it does, I'd be the first to say, absolutely fantastic. Okay. Uh, we are a bit running short of time. Maybe uh, one last question. Uh, could you please comment on China vis-a-vis -vis Korea, both North and South? Oh, well, <laughs> a big one. You know, if if I was this, this is one of the things that that is is in. I go into this in my book, and you know, you you look at what North Korea is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and what China is doing in the region, and the the, uh, the 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 threats and the insecurities that are being created by China and North Korea are are what brought two important American allies, Japan and South Korea, together to close up long festering wounds. Now, that's not a strategic outcome. If you're China, you don't want those two major and important U.S. allies with huge American forces based on their territory to be friends. You don't want that. India, we have these skirmishes up on the mountains. There's, there's no strategy. There's, 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 no, there's, there's no invasion that's going to happen across the top of the Himalayas. Why would you get into a spat with a nuclear-armed neighbor that controls access to your oil that has to pass right through India's backyard on the way to, to China. It's it's dumb. So when I when I see some of these things um, that that the Chinese are doing in the foreign policy realm um, that that make it more difficult for China to get on with the rest of the world and to actually create alliances like like the Quad and the rapprochement between. It, it, it helps to look at uh, China's history, and I have some quotes from Frank Lavin um, and, and other ambassadors in my book that, that talk about how China is often kind of stuck in some of its absolutist positions. And um, it, it goes back to um, uh, the iron rule number one um, in, in the presentation. So, yes, um, there are things that China is doing which don't make any sense to us on the outside. Um, but it has more to do with Chinese culture and Chinese history than, than most people understand. Okay, thank you so very much for this very insightful presentation. And then thank you everyone for coming to another Considering China webinar series. Our next one will be on May 18th, and then we will invite Dr. Leda Hongfincher to talk about uh, China's uh, decreased population and uh, China's women's rights. So I uh, look forward to seeing all of you again for, um, I think that will be the last one for this academic year. Thank you for coming. Yeah, see you soon.